All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm gonna give you just one more minute um, so people can join in case they are a little bit late. Um, uh, as you will see in the chat, I will put it, I put it now, but I also will put it a little bit later. There's a, there's a link uh, that will tell you to take you to this website. And in that you will find uh, basically all the information that you might need to follow the lecture of today. Uh, unfortunately, due to the time constraints, I will, um, this cannot be a, a very practical session where you know where we go back and forth. So I'm going to demonstrate everything that I'm going to teach you today. Um, but uh, at the same time, if you follow the training material, then you should be uh, more than capable to do all of the steps uh, yourself later on. So um, uh, my name is uh, Rafael. Uh, I'm a scientific officer at the Center for Cellular Imaging. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, we are part of the National Microscope Infrastructure in Gothenburg. So we are the Gothenburg node. And the idea of uh, the lecture of today is just uh, show you the very basics of uh, bioimage analysis. And for that, I'm also going to be using a, a tool that most probably most of you are at least familiar by name, which is called Fiji or ImageJ. Um, and then we're going to use that tool to demonstrate all of the concepts that I'm going to be talking about, right? So um, le let us slowly start, okay? So um, first of all, uh, as I just mentioned before, uh, we're going to be using uh, ImageJ. In particularly, we're going to be using Fiji. And here you will find uh, the websites for uh, both ImageJ and Fiji. And if you want to follow along, uh, please feel free to open up your Fiji and try to keep on. Or if not, you can do this afterwards. Um, just go to the Fiji website, and there you can also find the download instructions, okay? Now, the program of today's uh, is a relatively packed uh, but short program. So the first thing I'm going to try to remind all of you is that images are numbers and that they should be treated as any other numeric data that you receive from any other machine, right? So images are not special just because your brain can interpret them. You should also treat them carefully and as uh, serious numerical data. Now, I'm going to show you then uh, what happens when we're going to try to quantify something on an image. And usually for this, we design a small workflow. And there is some steps that we are usually doing. So we are going to do uh, some image loading. And after that, of course, we're going to do some pre-processing of the image to enhance the features that we want to work on. Then we're going to segment those regions that are important to us. And then we're going to do some sort of quantification. Uh, and that's a little bit what I will show today. Uh, also, I want to let you know that there's a lot of important resources. They are all listed in the link for the course of today, so I'm not going to lose a lot of time. But I want to uh, emphasize especially the image to the C forum. Uh, that is a place where you can go and uh, put any type of questions from the big to the small. And uh, you will be surprised as to how fast and uh, how friendly uh, the people are in that community when replying to you. Now, so let us start with something very simple. And just to remind everybody, again, that images are numbers. So what I'm going to show you first, uh, you can download these files. If you go to the material, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to go File, Open. And in this situation, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to open just a text file. So you see, if I hover over it, it says it's a text document, right? And if I open that text document, then Fiji on understands that this is a text document. It does not open it, therefore, as an image. And what you see is that you see a bunch of numbers, right? And um, just by looking at the numbers, it's going to be very difficult for you to know what is actually in this image. Now, if you want to actually open this as an image, there's a different way if you have a text file. What you can do is you can go File. Then you can go into Import. And then you're going to import text image. Right. So then again, if I open this text file, now Fiji is going to try to interpret these text files as an image. So it's expecting to find a matrix of numbers. If I say open, then suddenly I think it's going to be a lot more obvious for you what was the image that was hidden in the numbers. Right. Now, what is happening here in the background is that Fiji is opening that matrices of numbers. And to each number, of course, is assigning a color. The question is then, how does it assign the color to that number? So the uh, easiest way to look at is that that's based uh, on something that is called the lookup table or LUT. So if you were go now, right now, and you go to image, color, and then you ask to show the LUT, you will see this is the lookup table that is currently used by Fiji. You can change this. We'll cover that later. But you will see that the idea is that small numbers will have a dark color, while large numbers will have a bright color. Right? 
Excellent. So now we understand, okay, how does uh, the computer interprets the numbers to an image is basically it assigns them in a matrix. So the position in the matrix is a pixel position, and then the intensity in the image is given by the LUT, the intensity and the color. Now we're going to cover something as well, which is quite important. So let's go to the following. We go analyze, and we're going to make histogram. So then here, just use these uh, values uh, of use the peaks value range. We could cover that later on in the Q&A if you want. But the idea now is that you see that a histogram shows up and this is a histogram of all the values that are in the pixels of this image. So you see that uh, it starts from 47 because there is no pixel with a value below 47 and it ends up in 213 because there is no pixel with a value larger than that. You see that there is a lot of low intensity pixels, let's call them, that's the dark areas here. And there's a few very bright pixels, that's, let's say the area of the forehead, right? Now you will see, and also if you, re, uh, you check the text file, you will see that the, actually the text file is made out of integers. It means it's not 2.5, 3.75, it's all integers. Now you will also see that there is again a limit, a top limit to those integers. And the question is then, okay, is there any particular reason for that? And yes, there is a reason for that is that images are encoded uh, in, in bits. And depending on the amount of bits that we use to encode the intensity, then we have different options. So for example, you could imagine if you have an image which is just encoded with one bit, that means that for each pixel, the computer can only store a zero or a one, right? So then you only end up with two possibilities for colors, no matter the lookup table. So you can only have, let's say, background and foreground. On the other hand, if you want to have more levels of gray, then you increase the bit depth. Now, if you say two bits, then you have different combinations because now you have two. So you have zero, one, zero, and you have two uh, numbers of zero ones. And that combination will give you four possibilities, right? Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. If you end up with that, then you end up with the possibility of having four distinct colors. And then if you go to eight bits, you end up with two to the power of eight, that's 256 levels. And what is interesting about 8 bits is it actually corresponds to the accuracy of the human eye to see colors in general. So what happens is that this is a very good representation for the human eye. Nowadays, we tend to use larger big depths as such as 16 because we can uh, use computers to process those numbers much better. But let's say in the old days that the pictures were just going to be printed and 8 bits was more than enough. Now, you will notice something interesting if you pay attention to this image. If you come here to the corner, you will see that this image was read as a 32-bit. And that means that actually, why is it a 32-bit when obviously my numbers are not larger than 255? So it, it's probably an 8-bit image. Well, the reason for that is that this text file is super simple. It just contains numbers and it doesn't have any extra information regarding the image. This extra information is what we usually refer to as metadata. As there is no metadata in that text file, Fiji doesn't know what to do with it, it loads it as an image and it assigns the, uh, the biggest uh, bit depth that it knows to try to avoid any problems in case that you had very large numbers in that text file. Now, let's see the difference if I am actually loading an image file, a file that has actually a, a image format. So now uh, we go to the next step and what I'm going to do is the following. I'm gonna do file, open, and notice that now because it's not going to be a text file, I can do directly open. And then I go to this image. If I hover over it, you will see that it says item type TIFF file. You might be familiar with this or not, but a TIFF file is actually a image format. Now, if I go and I click open, now you will see that the image opens up, right? And more important than any the other things that I wanted to show you is the following. You will see now that it says eight bits. So why does it know now Fiji that it should load it as an eight bit? It's because this information was actually stored in the metadata of the image. So for you, this is also going to be very important if you're working in microscopy because metadata is not only the bit depths. In many cases, if it's coming from the microscopes, you will see that it has a lot of information regarding uh, the acquisition parameters, which camera did you use, uh, what settings of the filters and so on and so forth. So metadata is really, really, really important. Okay, now, uh, images are not only grayscale images, right? So as you know, we have, for example, if you go and you take a color camera and you take a picture, that is a, what is called an RGB image. In microscopy, they are not uh, very much used in fluorescence, but they are very much used in uh, other methods, 
such as, for example, polarization uh, imaging sometimes, or in histological samples and so on. So now let's open another file. So I go file open. And then what I'm going to go is that I'm going to open another TIFF file. But this time, this TIFF file, as you see, it will give me a color image. And the reason why it gives me a color image is because it actually, Fiji now knows that this is an RGB image and it, twist, it treats the image as such. But what is really happening in the background is an RGB image is a combination of three images on top of each other. Okay, so what you have is called RGB because it's red, green, and blue. And the combination of that red, green, and blue gives you the result of, for example, this phase in this case. Okay, so how can we actually uh, try to investigate the actual colors of the image? Now, there is a, a relatively easy way to do that. So what we can simply do is just uh, right now, this is just an RGB image and it's treated as like this. But then what we can do is that we can go um, image type and we're going to change it to an RGB stack. Okay, now you immediately see that it becomes gray in color. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is that you see, I'm gonna go over the slider that appears now at the bottom. So before there was no slider, now there is one. And you see that every time I change, the image changes a little bit. That image changes a little bit because what is happening is that that was the images that I told you before. This is the red image, the green image, and the blue image, okay? Now, if we want to see this in the, uh, this is a hyperdimensional stack. So this is three images connected to here. If we want to see them with color again, so there is a way to do this. So we go image, color, and then we say, uh, please make a composite, okay? Now, when you make a composite, Fiji, what it's now doing is that it's taking those three colors, it's assigning the correct LUT to them, so the correct lookup table, and then it's displaying them at the same time. If you want to check that this is actually the case, you can also do, go to image, color, you can go to channel tools, and here you see right now it's displaying as a composite. I can deactivate channels if I want, or I can activate them. But also you can do, for example, okay, show me each color independently, and now using the slider, then I can see what was the red, green, and blue, all right? At the same time, you can also show them in grayscale if you want to, okay? So this is just basically to uh, show you and remind you what is an RGB image, and that images can also be multidimensional, meaning that they could contain many, many different colors, and at the same time, that they can uh, contain uh, not only information about color, but let's say uh, information about time, that could be a dimension, or information about the C stack, if you have three-dimensional views and so on, all right? So um, now what we're going to do is that I'm going to show you a slightly different image. So this is RGB images. Now let's show you something that usually comes for, for example, from a fluorescent microscope. So if you want to do that, you can go into file, open samples, and then we're going to open fluorescent cells, okay? This will take a second because it downloads the image from the internet. Now you see the fluorescent cells, right? Now what you see, this image, again, it shows red, green, and blue, but please keep in mind that in fluorescent images, this is actually not, uh, nobody is obliging you to use red, green, and blue. I know that many of us, they, we say we use blue for DAPI because it was the most blue fluorophore, green, uh, and, and so on, depending on the fluorophore that we use. But in fact, the cameras that we use in fluorescence are colorblind. So uh, in most cases, these are actually just three differently acquired grayscale images that are put together, and then you decide on a lookup table that is good for you. But for example, in many cases, I don't like to display things in red because I, I don't think it's punchy enough, especially when you print it. Uh, it might be that you lose a lot of details. So for example, let's say you see here in the channel, I can try to look for the channel that is currently red. You see that this little blue line here is changing color. So this is blue, green, now it becomes red. So in there, what I can now do is I, I can change the lookup table, okay? So I can go to... Um, uh, let's say, uh, I always forget where this one shows up, is in image lookup tables. And now what I'm going to say, for example, the red one, which is the one I have selected, I can change, for example, to gray. And to me, this looks a little bit better because I can see better the details, at least, if, I, if this is the, the staining that I'm most interested in. At the same time, there's a lot of different lookup tables, so you can play with this. And other ones that are very good uh, to play with are this cyan hot and magenta hot because they change from a particular color to then white. 
So they allow you to even see structures that are of um, lower intensity. Okay, so with this, I think is my uh, very small crash course into uh, images and numbers, and that you should always keep this in mind. Now, I'm going to now jump into the classical image analysis workflow, okay? And for that, I'm going to do a very simple example of uh, pre-processing, segmentation, post-processing, and quantification. So let us start. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open a very classical uh, image uh, example. This image of rice on a surface, right? So now, uh, it, let us imagine that I want to quantify how many uh, pieces of rice do I have and also what is the size of them. So you might say, okay, the image it looks fairly good. By eye, I can clearly identify all the pieces of, uh, of rice. But remember that the computer, it only sees numbers. So for example, if you were to do image, adjust, threshold, thresholding is a process where you actually decide on an intensity cutoff and then you say, okay, everything above this intensity is the object that I'm interested in. What you will see is that it's very difficult for me to find a cut up value where I only get rice and I don't get the background. For example, if I want to have the north part of the image clean, you will see that in the south part of the image, I lose some of my grains. And if I try to catch those at the bottom, then suddenly, boop, the background starts to win. This basically means that I have to process this image to make it easier for the computer to identify the pieces of rice. So one of the uh, most common things that happens in biology and also in this image is that we have an uneven illumination. And for that, we would like to calculate the background and subtract that background. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you one of the most important uh, things is that you need to actually, in Fiji, you always need to be doing uh, duplicates. Because in many cases, when you actually create a, 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 an operation, uh, what happens is that the image to which you apply the operation is modified. So be careful with that in Fiji. So for example, I'm going to do image duplicate, and now I'm going to call this background, right? Now I have a copy of my rice, and now I'm going to modify this image. The trick that I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Gaussian blur. A Gaussian blur is uh, what you do is that you take a, a, a Gaussian uh, shape object, and you use it to blur the image. You might remember the discussion we had about PSF yesterday if you were here. So if now I click preview, you see how the image got uh, blur with a sigma radius of three. The larger the sigma, the larger my blur. The interesting thing about the Gaussian blur, if I apply it in this image, is that if I use a sigma which is large enough, you are going to remove all the objects which are relatively small. And the only thing that remains on the image is actually the low frequency or the very large sort of background, this un non-uniform illumination that was in the background. So if I do like this and I click apply, now I have an image that really resembles the background of my rice, all right? So now what would be the next step? The next step is simple. I think you can also understand that from a basic level, I just want to take this image and I want to remove that image. So what you're going to do now is a very cool tool in Fiji is simply called uh, the image calculator. So you go to process, image calculator. And now what I'm going to say is, okay, I want to take my image of rice and I want to subtract these other operations, of course, my background image. Now, here is very important, at least I would recommend that you create a new window. So the windows that you are doing the operations on remain on the back. And also please do remember to use a 30 do float when you're doing this type of operations, because if you end up with negative numbers for any reason, and you don't use 30, uh, a 30 bit float, uh, these numbers will disappear. They will end up in zero because integers, positive integers such as an on-site 8-bit cannot uh, store negative values. Okay, so this is a good thing to always have clicked when you are doing the image calculator. So I apply this and now you end up with the result. And you can see that this image is already much better for processing than this one, right? I think now, even if I just go now and I do image, adjust and I say threshold, you will see that now it's very easy that I don't have the problem with the background, right? Now, even though this image is already good enough to do our processing, I'm going to do some extra steps just as an example. If we pay attention to this image, you will notice that there is some sort of uh, background coming from the, from the uh, surface, right? These kind of uh, white spots on a dark background. And this, very, uh, this is also very common in cameras or in, in confocal images. This could be, for example, what we re uh, re refer to as uh, salt and pepper noise. 
If you want to remove these sort of things, there's a very good filter for that. And that's why I wanted to show it to you. It's called the median filter. So if I go here and I look for median, you will see that there is a process filter median. You can run that. Again, I can run a preview, it's always good. And then let's explore what the median filter is doing. So this is my original image, no filter is used. Now, if I say a radius of two, what it's doing is that it's concentrating on a particular pixel. It's looking at a radius of two pixels around it. And it's calculating the median of that window and it's storing the median of that window in the center position. Because of that, then it's very good, very efficient at removing spikes of noise in your image. So for example, if I were to do this right now, you can see that I'm blurring those spikes that were in the background. And I'm gonna say, okay. So now uh, if you were to use a median filter, which is too large, of course, and what happens is that you are gonna start to match objects. So you have to play with the Sigma to find a good radius. So now that we have this, then we're in a good situation where we are willing to now start doing the thresholding as I showed you before. So now what we're going to do is image adjust threshold. Now you see that it's very easy for the computer to find good values for the rise. But also I want to let you know that there is a bunch of different methods in Fiji for segmentation. And it's important that you try all of them because depending on the properties of the image, some will work better than others. Um, after you work for a while with different type of images, you might end up with your favorite methods, but it's always a good idea also to just try them all and see what's happening, right? So a very classical method is called Otsu, and this is one that I really like. Um, also, many people know how it works. So if you say, yeah, I use Otsu for segmentation, you know, they know what you were doing. So for example, if I use the Otsu method, you will see that it nicely segments the uh, rice grains from the background. Then all I have to do is I have to say, please apply this uh, segmentation. Also notice that I have to click dark background. This is because I'm interested in objects that have a larger intensity than the background. But if it would be the opposite, you just have to remove this, all right? Then uh, if you were to have, for example, a, a C stack and you want to have a single threshold for the whole C stack, you can also click here with say stack history. Okay, in any case, so now that I'm happy with this, you click on apply. It will be converted to a mask. You say, please do so. And voila, now we have the segmentation of the rice, right? So now let us think, how can we do to quantify the numbers of rice? And there we go to uh, the next very cool tool about Fiji. One of them is called analyze particles. So the first thing that we have to do is that we have to decide on what are the properties of the regions of interest that right now are marked here as white. You see that the value, if you see here on the top of your Fiji on this corner over here, you will see that if you hover over something, it tells you the value. So you see the rice has a value of 255 and the background has a value of zero. That's how it knows that what is in this interesting for Fiji, okay? So then what we're going to do is that the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm gonna go into analyze and I'm gonna go set measurements. As I told you just at the beginning of the example, I'm just interested in the area of the rice, but also, for example, if you're quantifying, uh, let's say fluorescence staining uh, around, I don't know, uh, at the nucleus, then you could also uh, use that for um, intensity measurements. And if you are interested in intensity measures, so that for example, um, integrated density or mean gray value or so on, you need to redirect this image. We can cover that later in the Q&A if you want, but the idea is that you can tell because you see, this is, like, this is an image where intensity is not important, right? I only know the objects that are important. So then you have to redirect your intensity measurement to the image that is actually important for you. Usually is the raw data. Okay, so again, I'm not interested in intensity, only area. So I click there, I don't click anything else. And I say, okay, that tells Fiji which numbers are important for me. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into analyze and I'm gonna say analyze particles. Okay, in here, you have a lot of different options. We could discuss this later, but I'm gonna say, okay, analyze particles of any size, of any circularity. I don't want you to show me anything special, but what I want you to do is please display the results clear any results that you had previously, add them to the manager, this stands for the ROI manager, we will see what that is. And then I'm gonna kick the other ones clear and I'm gonna say, okay. So what happens is the following. First, this is what is called the ROI manager. What is keeping track is of the different objects that you have selected, you see? So if you go over it, you will see the different kind of grains of rice will now go in blue, in uh, this sort of CN color, okay? Now for each of those objects, you have a result, and that means that you have for each rice, now you have a value of area. 
if you, for example, just want to quantify the number of rice, you could, for example, just go to the bottom of the, of the table and you will see you had 98 pieces of rice that were detected. And now, for example, what happens if I just want to have a quick idea of what was the size of the rice? Well, what you could do is you could go to results and then you could go into uh, distribution. This is going to make a histogram. Uh, right now I'm specifying uh, 20 beans and uh, beans for the histogram and I say one area. And if I click OK, you will immediately see this is the histogram of the area of all these pieces of rice. Now, if we pay uh, close attention to this histogram, something quite interesting happens. You see, we have a lot of rice that have a very specific value. If you see here value and I hover over it, you see it's around 700 or 800. But then we have a few here that actually have exactly the double. What is happening is that you see there were some objects that merged to each other because they were too close. Okay, this is a very common problem. So what I wanted to show you is uh, two things. First, we have that problem. We have the problem of merging. The other thing that we have, you see, there is a lot of rice that was touching the edge of my image. Those are very bad rice to quantify because they are being caught. You see, we have a population here of very small pieces of rice, and that's just because they were at the border of the image. So if we want to get rid of the border image, that we can do relatively easy. So what we could do is that we can go again to um, analyze, analyze particles. And right now you're going to click this thing that says exclude on edges. So what it's going to do is that it's not going to take into account any object that is touching the edge of the image. If you say, okay, and you say, I don't want to save the previous ones. Ah, uh, oh, sorry, I select the wrong image. So I have to try again. Um, Analyze, analyze particles, exclude edges. I say, okay, why no particles were detected? Let me double check. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Fiji, why are you doing this to me? Okay, image, I just, let's try, let's run a threshold again, just to make sure. Analyze, analyze particles, I say, okay, there we go. So now what we have is that what we have is that we have exclude all the pieces of rice that were on the edges. And you now see that on my table, on my result table, what I have is now uh, 70 pieces of rice. Of course, I have less than before. And now if I do the same, I say results and I say distribution. You now see, okay, we got rid of all these small guys that were a little bit annoying, but we still have the problem of pieces of rice that have matched with each other. So how we get rid of this, well, there is a, a very interesting calculation, which is called the watershed. Again, I cannot cover exact explanation for you today. If you want, you can go into these websites. But the idea is that this is a method in which if you have two objects, uh, it kind of from the center of, of, of the objects, it tries to build up, uh, like if you were starting to feel water in this object, and it's gonna find out that if you feel it from the center of the objects, and the water is filling, filling, filling. At some point, it's gonna find the water which was growing from the other object, and it's gonna build a barrier between them. Okay, so for example, if we pay attention to this number seven, we will see what's happening if I try watershed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very simple watershed. I'm gonna go into process, uh, binary, and I'm gonna run watershed, okay? Now you see that a black line appears now between these two objects, again, because of the kind of very simple explanation that I gave you before, right? So now the interesting part is that if I do the same thing again, I say plugin, uh, sorry, analyze, analyze particles. I do the same process as before. I say, don't save them, please, Broom. Now you see that I will, uh, now I say results, distribution. So now you see that those uh, values are completely gone. And now I end up with a distribution that makes a little bit more sense to me. Right? So the problem is that sometimes watershed can also uh, generate some mistakes. So this is something that you have to keep an eye so you don't divide objects that you didn't want to divide. But in this case, we were quite successful. Right? So again, this is just to show you a little bit what is the most common uh, kind of workflow in Fiji. Now, just before I finish, I'm not, I don't have the time to really explain how this works, but everything that you do in Fiji can be sort of recorded in what is called a macro, basically a list of instructions, like a recipe, like when you are cooking, okay? So then I'm gonna do the following. Look, I'm gonna do file, and I'm gonna say, close all my images, please. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm gonna, there's an example in this material that I gave you of a file, it's called basic macro example. I'm gonna put this over here. 
If you generate a macro, again, we can take this uh, in different type of courses, but you will see that there is instructions that you can run. Okay, everything that is in this yellow pinkish color are instructions to Fiji. Everything that is in green is just messages to the human, so it knows what's going on. So okay, I say, okay, please close all of the images, open the image that I want, duplicate and calculate background. You see, it's very obvious what is going on. If I read my uh, comments of what I have been doing, and the very cool thing is that if I have my recipe ready, all I have to do is to run my macro and everything is automatically done for me and I end up with the results, okay? So uh, just to let you know that once you actually know what is the process that you want to follow, you can actually record this in some sort of recipe and this recipe can be used and not only in this image, but then you can learn how to reuse it, for example, on a very large set of images, or you can also distribute it to your friends or to your colleagues and they can try. Also very important for scientific uh, publications is that this recipe is very clear. If you attach this recipe to your material and methods as a supporting information, people will really know exactly what you did to each one of your images and then it's much better for communicating science. All right, so that's really all I have uh, to show you today. I hope that it was fun and now I'm gonna check if there were any questions in the Q&A.